Welcome to the Everyday Investor, Cole Hopfier. How are you? Thank you for having me once again for, I believe, our fourth collaboration, Darcy. It's fantastic. Well, let's let's see what happens because we haven't done a massive amount of prepping for this one, but we'll get onto it shortly before we do. For those that are new to the show who haven't kind of gone through our extensive back catalog now and discovered the other episodes that we've done, can you explain to our listeners what you do, who you are, how you work? Sure thing. My name is Cole Hopfjall. I am the chief executive fishmonger of Find Fat Fish. It is a done with you alternative financial education service designed to help wannabe retirees make more by investing as a hobby long term than they earn in their jobs with the intention of having it be not that they're making money for money's sake, but that they're solving two problems working backwards from just feeling the terror and weight of being under those problems, those problems being I work because I have to, not because I want to. And I am absolutely horrified that if I don't create some kind of a shift and upgrade in my trajectory, I am going to go bankrupt as an older person for being an older person. I'll either never retire or I will outlive my money. And so basically I have an eight week course that is custom crafted and personalized to help people that are dead serious about showing up and solving those problems to do so psychologically in short order and then feeling that their ability to do so financially long term is now a when not an if and an inevitability rather than like some impossible possibility mm. in a sense you're you are like a writer as well aren't you like you you have a way with words where does that come from oh yeah so my um well thank you first of all um uh, back at you my um <laughs> <laughs> my um my background in terms of uh, academics and like formal training is in creative writing, screenwriting, aggressively offensive comedy. And um, my dad, who for context um, was, how do I paint his picture concisely? He was a fighter pilot in Vietnam. And then he ended up being sort of one of like the old boys on the ground selling bonds uh, in like the bond business in Wall Street in the 80s. And then the hedge fund guy. So it's kind of like a, you know, a bad, tough, hard nosed financial type. And so when he found out that his youngest son was studying screenwriting, I was in uni, as the cues would say. And I got a phone call where he said, listen to me carefully, a man can leverage money or a man can leverage time and you doing this have to learn how to make money with your money because you will not make money with your time. And so he pulled me out of university and he taught me investing an hour a day on a cruise ship that he was living on at the time. And by the end of the second hour, I had everything that I needed to start and most of what I've needed to not need a nine to five because of my ability to make money with my money. And after a certain period of time where his um, there was aspects of what he was saying in, on the investing side that I didn't agree with at all. But what he said that I did agree with was so powerful, much more powerful than my creative writing background, needing to rely on leveraging screenplays for money, et cetera, that I asked myself, I was like, is there a way to use creative writing, peer tutoring and amateur investing to do for any normal person what he did for me? And can I sort of take my English major background and use that as a major asset in the education of investing? So that was kind of the fusion, which took place, started to take place in about 2011. Sure. So ironic, you were on a boat and you were being taught how to fish. Yes, exactly. Uh, mm. And fi uh, Fine Fat Fish was years away from being thought of as, as like a name for it. Um, but eventually, yeah, it, it, Fine Fat Fish came about as a result of a collaboration with a really talented artist in Brooklyn named Steve Wasterball and his wife, Pia, who basically we were thinking about what is a metaphor for financial independence? What is a metaphor for being on the other side of the problem of being scared about where to invest every dollar that you've ever made and every dollar that you'll ever make. And to us, sort of a really nice metaphor for it was this fat fish, this cartoon fish made out of money symbols, this sort of like Mickey Mouse of money that symbolized sort of the end result of teach a man to fish versus feed a man a fish. And so by teaching yourself how to catch a fat fish, you will never again rely on anyone other than yourself because you will be self-sufficient in that way. Let's go back to, to your dad and the education that he imparted onto you. It's something that it's a theme that I guess with the work that I do, I probably loosely touch on it with everybody I talk to. And it's this idea of intergenerational wealth transfer. Mm. And most people, most of the time, will probably focus on what's inside the container 
We're trying to get enough wealth. We're trying to get financially secure, make sure our retirement is okay so that we have surplus and we can pass it on to our kids and give them a start. And the assumption mm. being that they will figure out on their own how to do the things that you figured out, which created that surplus. And instead of focusing on the liquid, I kind of always think, well, what about the carrier? What about that container? Mm. And that's kind of, I guess, what your dad did, right? Was he, he helped to teach you how to be a more effective container and gatherer mm. to not only get out there and learn how to fish yourself, but to do it in a way, presumably, that helps you maintain that wealth, right? Oh, like, absolutely. I mean, so for me, the um, sort of my values in creating the service and the business, particularly the service was number one. And this is anything that, that any time that I talk to somebody who is feeling the itch of starting their own thing, but they don't know what to do. It's essentially like my values in this and your mileage will vary is how can I provide the service that I was blessed to receive? If I, if someone hadn't done this for me, my life would be a shell of what it is, but then moving beyond that. And this is where mine is an expansion of what I got on the cruise ship is how can I provide the service that I wish I'd received? And so to me, in my interpretation, the, the service that I was blessed to receive was essentially a, an angry, productive confrontation where it was like, you need to learn how to do this and you will do it now. You will do it with my guidance. You will do it on the spot right now. And then what the, um, the expansion of it is how do I actually, and with respect to my dad, like there was aspects of what he was bringing to it that were over academic, over numerical, under effective, um, that he just kind of, he couldn't see it simply because he'd been educated, gotten his uh, MBA at Wharton, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, and so like, if you can actually come at it from a true beginner's perspective and simplify it even more, make it even more simple, mm. how can I rip a decade or more off of somebody's development, off of the development of their human capital inside of a couple of weeks? and then put them in a position where they can stand on their own two feet as a self-sufficient investor thinking in coming from an entrepreneurial mentality faster. And along those lines, to your point, um, you can't obviously, anyone who's promising that they can guarantee financial transformation for you in eight weeks is not only selling something, they're selling something that is dishonest. <laughs> However, and I know this as a fact, and I think you do too, you can infuse that human capital transformation, that psychological transformation easily within eight weeks. And then, you know, to your point, it's not about handing somebody a bunch of money or even like a book of, um, of like pointers and then get out of the way. If you can permanently elevate their psyche and their human capital on this, the financial results will follow as long as they can find it in themselves to follow through. And that's what any good parent in my opinion, not to be over judgmental, but like any, any good parent that believes this is doable should endeavor to do for their kids. I think the main barrier there is just that a lot of people don't think that it is possible. And it is obviously what any good teacher or coach should do for their like pupil or client is help them achieve that permanent self-empowering before and after that then makes their ability to declare whatever they want and then go get it under their own power something that's available to them indefinitely. You and I probably share a lot of the same way of, I, w I won't necessarily call it a gift, it's probably sometimes a, a curse where you can kind of see the complexity in something and you could probably like looking over horizon, see the mountaintops and see how they all kind of connect to each other. To distill that into a form that is palatable for an everyday person to get, sometimes that's challenging. Mm. And for me lately, I've really been benefiting from just taking my kids to school and having a chat to them in the morning, because they're learning about stuff that's around the edges of this, about how to invest, how to grow wealth. And what does an interest rate mean, dad? And what does it mean when I'm taking out a loan? And what does it mean when interest rates go up? And all these lead to conversations that I can answer 20 different ways, but it's all based on me trying to explain it at someone who's at the same footing as I am. Yes. To bring it down, mm. I find that incredibly valuable. Like it's challenging, but to bring it down, not by dumbing it down, right? bring it down so that a 12 year old can understand it. In the process, you end up, I think, productizing, digitizing, reformatting complex things. You're distilling it, aren't you? Mm. Without, that's, that's not a skill that everybody can pull out of the hat. Mm. Having a gift with words makes it a lot easier, though, doesn't it? 
Well, it's interesting on a broad variety of levels, and I comprehensively agree to me, like having a background in because, you know, people that are in financial services, let's say, and they'll the first thing and it's a defensive reflex rather than a logical question is like, what makes you qualified to do this? I was like, well, if you want to compare case studies, I'm happy to do that all day long. But then the other thing is one area where coming at it from more of like a creative, uh, emotive um, like in terms of empowering other people where that gives you an advantage amongst other areas is, well, like screenwriting in particular. And I was also a philosophy minor. So like syllogisms, it's mostly about structure and concision. And so how much power can you pack into this structure while still being concise is a really good and helpful way to frame a course. Do you want to give me an example of that? Are you talking about like metaphors even? Like how do you construct a metaphor without? Oh, a hundred percent. So, so let's say, um, I I would I reckon that nothing is more difficult to write than a quality um, satirical or comedic movie, and so like a ninety page screenplay that is actually hilarious. So it gets done what it needs to get done on a story level, but with enough color and pop and satire that it really like pops off the page and says something ridiculously hard to do. And so similarly, and this is a thing that you see when you have a writing background and then you step into the wild west of online education is you see these people marketing like we have 850 hours of content. And it's like, that's not good. That means that you just bloviated into a microphone like like undiscerningly and then didn't edit anything. <laughs> and so for me, like if you can, like the more like to your point also that you made like a pill that's fun to swallow that is actually what is effective here, not this thing that sounds impressive. It's like a 3,000 page leather bound tome. It's like, wow, there must be a lot of wisdom in that. <laughs> like, it's a, that's false advertising in a way, just re literally reading a book by its cover ineffectively. Like, actually, the most quickly that you can careen someone through the transformation, and the more fun you make it for them, the more valuable it is. And to, an, to uh, that degree, I would share that some people that I've worked with lately and also just in general, um, I get particularly excited when they start talking about not only have they dialed this in, but now they're starting to take these sort of like exercises that I put them through and run their kids through it. And now they're having rewarding conversations with their kids. Like someone that I'm working with right now, he said that he has his, um, his son who has ADHD doing the dirty work on video game research. So he's doing like deep due diligence, not just on the games, but on the companies that make the games, bringing that, these reports back to his dad, who's just, synth who's then synthesizing it. And that, then he's having conversations at a higher level with, for example, like a daughter who is head of social media for a company who has all of the, all of this visibility that she currently isn't monetizing into where the world is going. And so basically when somebody is able to take it, internalize it, bring it on board, but then pass it on to their family tree that's willing to listen, like that's when it actually starts to become truly powerful. And at the core of that power is that it is concise, simple, and also really fun. Maybe now is probably a good time to sort of uh, describe what you do from a maybe even from a legislative point of view, because I, I fall under the jurisdiction of a whole bunch of rules because I'm a financial advisor. And if I call myself that, just like a doctor, I probably better know what I'm doing, but also I have to subscribe to a certain set of things. Mm. What you're doing is purely just financial education and coaching. Would that be correct? Absolutely. I think you would call it essentially an alternative education service and an alternative consulting service where, to be really clear, I'm not anti these these industries existing, but in the context of creating the transformations that I'm talking about, I have sub-zero interest in collecting someone's someone else's money to invest it for them or telling them exactly what to invest in or how much to invest or any micromanaging of what someone else is doing. What I'm looking for and who I'm able to help are people that are like, I am, and I'll, I, I have some ideas about this that we could get into, but basically among other things, somebody who's like, I really don't want people or entities telling me what to do, but I just do not see a viable alternative. And I don't see how to sanely do this myself, especially when you consider the stakes that I'm interested in playing with. And so people like that, that want the tools to be able to step into a permanent independence is, is a good fit for this. And anyone who's not, and there, as we've talked about really effectively and thoughtfully multiple times now, 
there are plenty of people who aren't going to be that and maybe shouldn't be that. And in which case, a stock newsletter, a financial advisor is the right fit. But the reason that this exists in the way that it does is I feel that there should be a really powerful alternative. And it's a little bit like another writing maxim of write the book that you wish you could read. I created the service that I wish I had had, I had, had access to when I started in 2006. I want to dig into the different types of people that you typically encounter because we're not all homogenous people. There's all sorts of differences and quirks and features with each certain personality type that makes it more challenging than others as an educator mm -hmm. to communicate to them, right? Oh, yeah, <laughs> for sure. And, th and that's where I mean, like a really good line when I was thinking about because I, I blew up a trajectory of um, like writing screenplays and books to do this. Maybe I'll return to that one day in the future. But I really like it was a thoughtful decision. And I was thinking deeply about stepping into teaching. And I sought out some people in my world in like LA and New York and some other places that uh, I knew were teachers and to see what they had to say. And the one thing that just stuck, it'll stick with me forever is it seemed so true before I had any teaching experience. He was like, he was a math teacher in LA. And he was like, the problem with most teachers is that they love their subject matter, but they hate the human race. And so like <laughs> bringing, bringing a curiosity about people is so incredibly important. And if you don't, if you can't bring that curiosity, I mean, you just won't be doing this very long. But you, you've touched on something quite interesting. It's a weird paradox, right? Like there's another slightly more cynical saying around teachers, you know, those who can't teach, but what you're, you're talking about, I guess, is more just, I guess, how ironic it is that sometimes the best are actually the worst in a weird way. Is that mm. kind of what you're saying? Interesting. Yeah, I think we, uh, I loved that line from George Bernard Shaw when I first heard it because it always like it's that teacher that you didn't like and you're like, yeah, you can't. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, there are just so yeah. many counter examples to that in the world. And I, and, um, but for example, like Michael Jordan probably not suited to coach basketball because it just comes so naturally and imperfection to him is just so odious and hard and hard to look at that for him, you know, loving your subject matter and not necessarily liking people enough to help them develop is is a thing. But there is, of course, plenty of examples in every arena of people who were pretty damn good at what they were doing. And they also love people. And then they step into more of like, you know, they apply HR to the way that they do everything else. And they're about lifting up the people around them. Yes. And, you know, they might not be like the ultimate virtuoso, but they're still quite good. It seems to come out that often people will value the right answer over the right person. They'll value being correct over the value of what potential that information has to move someone. Mm. And I think sometimes in the process, really good teachers aren't consulted. Like maybe your granddad is actually the best person to talk about with this particular problem mm. rather than your friends or vice versa. I don't know. So putting that aside though, mm. Let's talk about some of the client types that we're typical, that we're typically going to come across. You, you, you see them. You have some amazing names for them. So let's mm. go down some of the lists of people that you encounter. Yeah. So, I mean, plugging our amazing collaboration this time last year, um, which you it was uh, the courageous everyday investor. Really good conversation. That you putting that out drove some absolutely fantastic people into my world, and then also some. Like it was in the minority, but some frustrating. And to me, like you, because if you care about people in development, you're like, could that have been prevented? How could that have been prevented type situations? And so based on that, along with hundreds of conversations with prospects and more than a hundred collaborations with clients, I have some pretty serious patterns of people that I've encountered in New Zealand and everywhere else in part because of this podcast that 10 of which I would say are very, like should if you resonate with any of these, it's a green light that if you're feeling like you should go into motion on this, you're ready. It's just a question of believing that you're ready, getting some right support, striking that right sort of audacity and humility balance where you have enough audacity to believe that you can be helped and enough humility to ask for help, which can be quite elusive for people, along with five types that unless something changes in the way that things are structured, you should probably stay far away from this until something seriously changes in terms of either your psyche or your financial reality or both. And so the first one, and of course, I'm curious with you, any thoughts that you have on these kind of a public brain? I might, I might have different names for them, but yeah. this will be interesting. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but the first one would be the new and nervous parent. And so this is one that I've seen. And actually my first 
uh, client collaboration, which ended up being really successful as a good example of this, is someone who has been, quote unquote, wanting to learn how to take the reins for years, but there hasn't been that sort of in extremis moment where some part of you is struggling to breathe and you know that you need to make a change that actually compels you to make a change. And so for them, the the catalyst that moves them past that sort of sticking or stasis point is completely positive. It is that they're about to bring a child into the world. And the basic thought process, as far as I can tell, is I don't see how I can raise this kid with a straight face, look them in the eye and tell them how things are and how to act in this world. If I myself am scared of my own income, my own net worth, because I have no idea what I'm doing, how can I raise them to be an independent person if I don't feel comprehensively like an independent person? And so the people that have felt that and then they've owned it and they've taken it on that they're like, I'm going to resourcefully solve this one way or the other, that have come in and sublimated the pressure of that into opening up new doors for themselves have come in and done really well. And usually once you kick that door open, then it also opens up new doors for you as a person. So as an example, I worked with this fellow, Jerome, in 2016, who basically had been having like parents manage his inheritance for a long time, took it back under possession and multiplied it in such a way that not only was he confident in how to raise his kids and how to sort of manage the family estate, but he ended up leaving his job to start his own company while putting that in motion. And so when someone actually feels that right pressure and they harness it the right way, sky's the limit. But until they do, there's going to be this creeping guilt. Like imagine if you didn't have confidence with money and you were trying to raise up your kids, like what would that feel like? Pretty, pretty sad and disingenuous and like futile. Yeah. To be honest. It's a very bleak answer. Yeah, it's over. <laughs> <laughs> Could we get more dark on that one? Yeah. Um, no, like it, it would be, and it happens every now and then, like there's some questions that you get asked as a parent that really cause you to think like, Oh my goodness, I've never actually thought about that even for myself, let alone how to explain that. But it goes beyond that because you have to explain it, but also demonstrate it. Mm. So I remember when I was a kid, my brother just said to my parents who said to him, Oh, we can't buy that because we don't have money, which is a phrase that we outlaw in our family. You oh, wow. Never because of what it does to your brain in yeah. terms of creativity mm. and you can't solve the problem. But he said that and because he, he thought that, well, you just go to the bank and you get money, and, which is kind of true. <laughs> but but <laughs> he kind of thought that and um, my parents probably didn't have a very good answer for him. And so I've remembered that like I was probably like six years old when I remember hearing that. And so now when my kids ask me anything to do with money, I'm I'm ready. I look forward to it. And it's something that I consider it's it's one heck of a challenge. But like bringing kids on into the world, like for us, it was like a financial decision almost. And I think for a lot of people these days, that is a consideration because of the fact that it's so expensive, you're dropping down to one income. That means oh, you might not be yeah. able to live there. It puts people into such a position of fear. So the nervousness in these, you know, new and nervous parents, the nervousness part, that is totally understandable. Mm. Like they're putting weight on something they haven't had to put weight on before. Hmm. And they know the stakes are massive yeah. because this little creature is going to be dependent on them and they don't know what all the right answers are yet. Um, but from your perspective, like how likely are those new and nervous parents to be, to engage in a process like what you offer? Are they, are, are they the ones that are less likely to engage because of either it's just too expensive or it feels like it's too much of a commitment um, yeah. Talk about a term that turns off creativity is it's too expensive. Yeah. If they're in that headspace where like investing in your own investing education is an expense rather than investment and like a burden rather than an opportunity, it's already over. That's, right. That's an interesting area where, yeah. And it's so interesting that you are like in the most constructive way possible, like serving as a, as a despot over language, where it's like, there is no of this language in this house. You like kick out <laughs> anything that clo that closes oh, yeah, we off. Used to have so many children, but I got rid of most of them because they kept on saying, yeah, totally. <laughs> <laughs> well, that also brings overhead down. So yeah, that's true. Effective. But it's all, yeah, it's all like, basically my questions would be how nervous are they and how resourceful are they? How, how brave are they feeling? Are they feeling ready to do this? And then the other thing, and um and actually i'll so i, I guess i'll hip i'll hopscotch around these yeah, go for it. Go for it. so there's one that is not suited 
to do this until they've um, put their house in order. And that I have that written down as the mismatched matrimony. And essentially what that is, is a, you know, two, I mean, in 2023, I guess your language needs to be more open. So two people that are married in whatever configuration and their life partners, and I'm sure on a day to day, they figure out how for things to go smoothly. But when it comes to zooming out, looking at the bigger picture, what is the trajectory that we're on? What are we dealing with right now that is unacceptably tedious or just not what I want to be dealing with in 10 years? What What are the opportunities we want to capture that I don't want to be 85 in the rocking chair complaining that I wish I had had the clarity or the moxie to go for this? Like, what are, what are these things? And they just, for whatever reason, have not broached the these conversations with each other. I'm reminded of a rather cheesy, but also rather beautiful quote from the guy who wrote The Little Prince, which is that love does not consist in gazing at each other, but in looking outward in the same direction. They have no idea what that same direction is. And so for me, and just to put it point blank, because for me, this is turning into a no fly zone and getting it's the, the one of the few areas at this stage of the development of my program that I run into the same sticking point. I'm like, how do I make this go away is people who kind of like run through my gauntlet, ask for an hour of my time and haven't clarified anything as a couple about what are the what are the risks they're willing to take? What is the shared vision, et cetera? And so for me, that. Um, is a complete non-starter because with something of the level of investing with the intention of creating a life-changing and potentially like intergener intergenerationally changing nest egg and skill set, if you're not on the same page, it's, it's a no-fly zone. And so on the exact opposite of that was I was, um, I remember this time last year, roughly, I was talking to a husband-wife combo and they, their priority A was getting him out of sort of an unsustainable backbreaking routine as a veterinary surgeon. And she was at home raising a child um, as a, an entrepreneur as well. And when I, um, when I took them through and I put them in a position where they could pounce on this, but they needed to do something bold to start taking action on this now, or they could just defer this forever into the future, maybe they'll get to it someday. They sat in silence and I could feel in particular him contracting into himself. And, and I was like, this is one of those moments where like they either like come together as a team or they pull each other down. And she leans in after like maybe a minute of silence and she just goes, do it, do it. <laughs> And then she emboldened him to take action on it. And then as a team, they dismantled it and they changed their trajectory. But it would have been just as easy, just as easy for him, for her to just blow in the opposite direction and it wouldn't have happened. Mm. And so for me, your your choice of partner, and of course, that being said, there are moments where one partner is totally doing everything. And actually, I have something along those lines as a type, but it is vastly preferable to be on the same page with your spouse and for them to be, and for you to have made a deliberate choice about the targets that you're aiming at, the problems that you're there to conquer and the division of labor where it's like, I'm solo driving and you, you're either mute in the back seat or you're, you're kind of my co-pilot. Like those decisions have, have been made. And if they haven't been made, you're in that mismatched matrimony and you're in a position where, and I've seen this happen, even though I worked so hard to preclude it, it doesn't happen often, but what we don't want is for you to start making focused investments, even if you're prepared, if your spouse who said that they didn't want to be involved starts berating you at the kitchen table every day because the stocks are down, despite that this is long term, despite this is everything, that is where if you've actually like taken real skin in the game with at while still being mismatched, it actually becomes not just financially dangerous, but psychologically dangerous. A kingdom divided can't stand. Two can't walk together unless they're agreed. It's the divided up. kingdom is a better one. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> because you're right. Like, is, is, if there's somebody that didn't get the memo, you were sitting in the same meeting, but maybe you weren't quite listening at that part of the meeting, right? Mm -hmm. And that means that you haven't actually conquered that fear of what happens when markets tank. You're now going to be reaching for the sell button. And your better half is saying, ripping your hand away. No, no, we talked about this. And they're like, I didn't talk about anything. This is, you know, this is new information. That wasn't factored in. We need to pull out, mm -hmm. right? So there, there hasn't been the equal buy-in, I guess. And that's something that when the pressure comes on, you're either going to see it or you're not. Mm -hmm. And 
it's hard to spot it sometimes, right? But uh, but it, there's like lots of manifestations of this, isn't there? Uh, absolutely. And that's the thing where, yeah, for me, I mean, like the first piece of like the fine fat fish gauntlet is a call with me personally. We're getting clear on sort of what I call point A and point B. And so what you're currently doing, what's feeling like it's not working, the consequences of inaction, if any, and then getting clear on where you want to be. And it is very frustrating to me when someone says that their spouse doesn't need to be there. And then it turns oh, yeah, out that totally. they did because it's like, to they me, always need to be there. it would be so much better for them to be there and totally like half in half out be like, okay, I understand now you get to it then for them to not be there and then be like, wait, what's happening? And then, and then freaking out. And so, yeah, to yeah. Me, just joint buy-in, like you said, a United Kingdom by any means necessary is such an important intention that I promise is, is set in very few marriages. Yeah. And you don't have to be perfect to play the game, but no. it's just like, if you agree to do something like there's always going to be one person that has a little bit more emotion power behind it, or they're better at seeing the objective. That's mm -hmm. another thing. Like some people are just so much, more focused on the objective, whereas the other will be looking at the steps. Um, some of them will be looking at, hey, this this destination that we're trying to get to, that's going to bring me comfort, whereas the other person is going to be looking at it going, well, that's actually a good platform to go and do something better with that. And so you get all those different little nuances in relationships. And ideally, it's going to be a win win because no one has all the answers and you need to have some degree of tension within your relationship. But when you're working with people, with what you do in your course, you're trying to put the acid test on because we're talking about a massive outcome that is theoretically possible only if there is absolute buy-in to the process, right? If you fall apart midway through the process, you would be so much better having never done it at all. That's exact conviction is at the core of it. And as we've talked about on numerous occasions now, sort of informed optimism where, and two times now I've explained this and I've dropped a syllable, I would like to redeem myself. So in explaining this, there's four types of information. You have uninformed pessimism, which is useless kind of just in everywhere. You have uninformed optimism, which is dangerous and everywhere. And then you have informed pessimism, which is useful and, but it keeps you kind of stuck in place. Here's what not to do. Okay. But what do I do? And then lastly, you have informed optimism, which is blue rare, hardly ever see it. Very few people are in active possession of it. It is those couple of slices of insight or information, knowledge, whatever the case may be, that enables you to take aggressive and patient action when the rest of the world is paralyzed. On a stock picking level, probably also on an investing level, one of the main pieces, if not the main piece of fine fat fish teaching people stock picking is how do you independently find and know that you found those pieces of informed optimism that let you actually do something and then how do you act on that in a way that is congruent with your goals and supremely likely to get you where you want to go without overextending in terms of time or risk or whatever the case may be. So the, the, uninformed, the uninformed optimism, I guess, is analogous to being at the peak of Mount Stupid in the, uh, the Dunning-Kruger effect, which we, we talked about this before we hit, we hit record. So that's kind of like where you feel like, you have enough information to be dangerous, right? Like you can actually get out there and you feel like you can do this because most people can give most things a go. And most of the time they'll get some degree of success most of the time, hmm. but sometimes it's actually just luck. Like for example, people that will buy homes, um, renovate it for the first time and then flick it off for a gain during a rising market, they'll take credit for what the land is doing on its own, appreciating. So that brings me to another type Thank that you. I think un unless there is a, in this case, a purely a psychological transformation, they are in a very perilous place. And I think you could say at the peak of Mount Stupid and they're about to careen down that Dunning-Kruger graph. I have it down as sort of the delusional invader. And so that is somebody who, like for me, I don't, um, I do not put any stock, let's say, in my ability to predict the quote unquote market. I think that most people that are talking that way and, and actively backing that are um, turning what could be so simple and so predictably effective into something very precarious and dangerous for themselves and their families. But however, mm. I had hundreds of conversations with people in 2021 and there was like a two or three month 
uh, window in particular where it felt like almost everyone I was talking to was saying something along the lines of, well, you know, I opened a Robinhood account two or three months ago. It's up, oh, I don't know, 15, 20%. And I don't want to sound immodest, but I suspect that I'm a genius. And I'm like, okay, so why are we talking then? And they're like, well, okay, if, if you really need to know, I'm concerned that this, maybe this is luck. <laughs> <laughs> but, but then they hadn't experienced any kind of discomfort that would the like proper discomfort that would cause them to make an adjustment. And so then you see that the quote unquote market falls off a cliff and you had all these people that were thinking that they were investing, but actually they were operating with, you couldn't even say the strategy, but essentially like the whims of someone who is accidentally trading for the short term in stocks when they think that they're investing for the long term in companies. And um, whereas somebody who's clearly in their lane as a trader knows what they are and aren't doing and someone who's clearly an investor knows what they are and aren't doing, they're in this weird sort of invader place. And so those people, I promise you, all got scorched by the drop. They got exposed that they didn't know what they were doing if the market went down in a serious way. And so for me, if you are in the situation of you, you haven't quite found, it goes back to conviction and staying power, you haven't found the ability to actually stick to your guns when stocks fly up or down. You come to pieces, you end up panic selling in either direction because it's scary on the way up too you are in this sort of no man's land of neither trading nor investing and you need to figure out and I, you know there's nothing wrong with just getting field research and trying things until you have turned this to your interpretation but if there's real stakes you are better off getting support quickly especially if there's real skin in the game you need to figure out which lane you're in mm. and if you want to play both games what sort of the um, risk and time commitment stakes are for each game. Okay. And I talk to a lot of people that are like, I don't really know what I'm doing and yet I can't stop myself from doing it. And it's like, ah. <laughs> yeah, I call it lettuce hands. And I, I don't know if it's the right term. And so lettuce hands would be like really strong and firm when it's fresh, mm. right? Really confident when the market's good, it's just been harvested and whatever. But yeah, it goes wheel too pretty quick. That um, is <laughs> such a good, that is beautiful. Under a little bit, you know, under extreme circumstances. It, it's also, there's something about this taking risk for risk's sake. Mm. And there were a lot of very smart people on the various Facebook groups, 2020, 2021, little bit of 2022, which were exactly these delusional invaders <clears throat> that you're referring to. Mm. And um, they were really smart. Like you're teaching me stuff here. Like this is that's all the hallmarks of being someone who's half intelligent, where people are learning from what you're doing and probably not suffering too much. But it was just this subtle sort of um, twist in things where it is a game and what it is that they're hunting for is the, op like, not the, the opium, the, uh, mm -hmm. what's it called? The um, endorphins, right? The, I mean, the opiate effect probably also probably. checks out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's all they were doing. They were, they were risk takers for risk's sake rather than actually... That is, is, that's a really good, that is a really good observation. And that is something that comes up too, when you do a good job of asking a smart question, listening carefully, and then repeating the process to try and help them come to their own realizations right. is usually that kind of inquiry will show them that they're not sure what is priority A. Is it actually like fruition or is it merely excitement? And like, is this entertainment? Is this education? Is this transformation? Like, what exactly am exactly. I doing Why here? Why are we doing here? Are we just playing a game? And if you're doing that when the stakes are five, six, seven figures, what? I mean, and, and that's the level of emotional disorganization. And that's exactly right, is they could, and they probably are throwing like syllogism after syllogism at you. They're well-researched. They read a ton. They're up on short and short term trends, evergreen um, principles, et cetera, et cetera. But they're so emotionally organized that in terms of marshalling that battlefield of knowledge, they're doing it completely ineffectively. And when you've got that mismatch matrimonial piece going on, typically that's one party to that. That's and they, they might not even be willing to. And this is a thing yeah, that it comes up is like, what are you doing that you wouldn't even share with your partner out of shame? And if you're in that country, you're, we can be assured that something or multiple things are in deeply broken and deeply in need of repair in short order. Yeah, great. Give me another name. What else have you got? Yeah, so I touched on this before, and this has actually been, I would say, most 
there's been a heavy element of this in New Zealand and Australia in particular is the exhausted daredevil. Mm. And that is somebody who similarly, they prefer life at high speeds. And so I say that like people who love flying things or flying off of things, if they come in and learn a system that helps them sort of aim their brave and audacious and bold energy at the right target with the right sort of if then plan their ability to if you can help them zoom out and look at the forest and then zoom back in and just on their own race amidst the trees they're terrifying once they're properly armed a lot of the best success stories in find by fish are these people and a, another major part of the reason why they do so well when they're properly armed and motivated is that they've probably been doing some kind of work that started out flashy, exciting, lucrative, but now has become kind of just like a rut and not just a rut, but like a depreciating rut where they're not going to make more money and their bodies and maybe their families also are breaking down as a result of an unsustainable commitment. And so as an example, like I've worked with people, again, all um, these would all be listeners of the show that reached out, somebody that was working in the guts of a cruise ship, which is a much more dangerous environment, I learned, than you might think. Um, somebody who's working in a mine, um, some guys who fly to Papua New Guinea six to nine months out of the year to like do um, repair and fly helicopters. See, I know some of these people now that you're describing them. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll bet. Hello, hello, everyone. Yeah, hello. I would, I would drop your name as time permitting, but I'm thinking of you. Yeah. And um, and basically, they all have so much in common that they are probably wizards in terms of getting things done in the short term. And they have thrown themselves at trying to learn this, but there's just something about the bigger picture that is thwarting them. And the problem is if they don't solve it, they're going to be and continue to feel like sinking ships, like I said, in an unsustainable situation. And so they're like, you know, like I bend over backwards and I have to leave my family for stretches at a time, et cetera, to be making this like handsome salary. But I'm not at a point where I can be squandering not only the money, but the opportunity anymore, because I don't want to be doing this 30, 40 years down the track. And then they also typically have some sort of an anti-model, like the, the sort of elder statesman on the job that's been there way too long and isn't doing anything about it. They're drinking their body weight and whiskey and just kind of drowning their questions. And they're like, I can't be that guy. And so I found that people in that set of circumstances that properly just like with the new and ner nervous parent, they properly sublimate that energy into a productive focus, crush the psychological transformation and move much more quickly through progress in the real world That's than a lot of other people. How do you, how do you, for example, work with those exhausted daredevils to get them excited again? Mm. What, what, would, what would you do? Oh, interesting. So yeah, to me, it, it kind of goes back to, Usually the problems that they're running into are entirely because they like, as I say, with fine fat fish, and it's taken me a long time to arrive at these three boxes. I only work with amateur investors who have urgency, solvency and gender ambiguous balls. These people are typically like gravitating towards stuff that just scares the bejesus out of normal people. Like to me, and this is a counterintuitive thing, but like the average nurse is actually wired to invest better than the average doctor because of their anti-risk averse. They're probably gravitating towards, towards cage fighting, shark diving, jumping out of planes, this kind of thing. And then that kind of boldness applied to investing is actually much more important in terms of long-term focus investing than say, memorizing the intelligent investor. It's just way more to do with being able to follow through. And typically where they're coming up short has nothing to do with short-term action. If anything, they're probably doing too much. They're checking stock prices every 15 seconds. They're like overloading themselves. They need help in particular zooming out and being like, okay, so what is the time horizon that is desirable and doable in your, in your just gut opinion to be on the other side of this? And how are we goalposting that? What do you need to have in terms of what's missing in terms of confidence or whatever? And also in terms of material, like let's say liquid assets that enables you to never again trade another minute for another dollar unless you really decide that you want to. So helping them set a clear sort of X dollars in Y years target and then work backwards from that purposefully is one of the major things that they need, but a huge piece of that, and this is sort of very um, Tony Robbins in that, but it, but for a good reason, is 
clearly helping them visualize and future pace and to whatever extent you can emotionalize and capture in specific visions what comes as a result of doing that. And so as an example, I worked with this guy, Dan, in 2018, where he was um, successfully but un increasingly unhappily working in a mine, an aluminum mine in Australia. And he had socked away some money, and but he just couldn't stop checking his phone. So he had to hand it to a financial advisor. And he was so unhappy with it because he didn't think that they were doing it right. They were being opaque. He was paying fees. He just so unhappy with it. And he also was really demotivated because he didn't want to grind to give them more money. And so when I told him what I did, he was very enthusiastic and leaned in. And essentially his vision was, um, I want to be able to retire by 35, which would have been seven years out. And I don't just want to be sitting on my hands. I want to be traveling the world, training jujitsu in particular, like with the most exciting people in the world. And that was his vision. There's no wrong vision other than the vision that, that isn't clear or right for you and that isn't sort of in line with your spouse if you have one. But that vision was enough to galvanize him to essentially turn five figures into seven over the next year and a half. And you can't promise that kind of timing. But what you can promise is that there are adjustments that people like that can and will make that put them in a position to have that be a probability where like that vision becomes a long-term probability rather than something that'll never happen with their cur current action diet. Yeah. So put them in a position of maximum potential benefit. Yeah. Stacking <laughs> sort of stacking imbalancing risk and reward in an intelligent and personalized way without squandering sort of money or time or emotional energy. Mm -hmm. Listening to you talk, there's so many things that you're saying where like I could substitute the words in my head to kind of give my version of what you just said, but it's not, um, it's, it's 90% like what you're saying, mm. but it's like, and I guess that's the thing, right? Like when you're getting advice, it just highlights the fact that when you're getting advice from people, regardless of what you call that advice, what qualification, what type of advice that is, your personal trainer, you're a mechanic, you're a financial advisor, whatever it, really does depend on who that person is mm. as well as who you are and where you are. And if you have a partner where they're at, it, there's a lot to it. Right. And it all comes back to that word mindset and 90% of what I do, I'm sure you probably call that mindset mm. and people, when they come to you, when they come to me as well, it would be like results, right? Show me what stocks to buy. Where do I invest? Like these are all the things I hear all the time. I don't tell people which managed fund you should invest in, mm. but I'll teach you how to figure it out mm. and I'll teach you how to construct it and put it all together and set some goals and see how you're tracking towards it. And, but before we even get there, we're going to spend a bit of time and talk about who you are, mm. um, because if we don't do that, we're building on not a solid foundation at all mm. because of what, what we're talking about here. Absolutely. And, and, one of those things, I learned this through sort of a really great coach who taught, taught me, I guess you could call it like best practice marketing and sales and just running a small business is like embodying sort of who who is most like respected in the culture as an authority. And then how can you sort of emulate that in a way that is likely to help people? And um, And so like there's a thing in sales called the doctor frame. And so it's really, really important to be that bring that same frame that a doctor would bring to a checkup. And part of what's underpinning the doctor frame is certainty that you can help them past whatever their idiosyncratic thing is. But if they're not straight up with you and saying what's wrong, you cannot prescribe a solution. And the, the concise term for that, I guess, would be um, prescription without diagnosis is malpractice. And so when people come straight at me and it's like, tell me what stocks to buy, tell me this and that, if you're so good, this should be effortless, et cetera. To me, it is genuinely prescription without diagnosis is malpractice. And I don't even know if you're, a, if I can help you or if I want to until I am clear on what exactly is the problem that you're here to solve yeah. and what exactly is that core ambition that you're here to grab. And circling back to something that we talked about a year ago, essentially the, um, and there's nothing wrong with either of these mentalities. It's just useful to understand for yourself, which one you gravitate to is the quote unquote employee nine to five mindset. You're probably prioritizing the painful problem that you want to get away from. And if you're the, in the entrepreneur mindset, the opportunist mindset, you're probably prioritizing 
this like shiny, super attractive thing that you don't actually need it, but you need it. And, and that, and that is in that. And so like for people, but to identify both and then choose which one you really gravitate to, to me is best practices. And without those pieces of information, you just like, in my case, I would be, it would be irresponsible for me to even attempt to help somebody because we wouldn't even know the target we were aiming at. Mm, that's good. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Let's, let's do another name. Sure. Let's see how many we, we, we can get through. Yeah. So, um, let's do the in strife housewife. Okay. I don't know if you're allowed to use those words in 2023. I'm doing my best. Um, we could also say the understated matriarch, but essentially, um, what it is, is a partner who's other partner and typically the split that i've seen is the other partner is the quote unquote breadwinner so they're the person that is outside of the home driving revenue trading time for money typically doing something that on paper is extremely impressive and then their partner is at home managing the home so controlling expenses etc and obviously there's many iterations that this can be but this does show up a fair amount for whatever reason the breadwinner is unwilling to even come to the table to talk about in which direction their revenue and their financial life's work is being invested. And so they've dropped it in the la in the lap of who's considered like a housewife and who isn't contributing financially is now in this position of being like, well, I don't know how to even say this, but my partner isn't willing to be on the phone right now. And like, I do have total autonomy to do this. I wish it wasn't like this, but it is. Probably a lot of people listening would, would fit into that category, I'd suggest. Yeah. And, and to be perfectly honest and straightforward, I mean, people think about money and investing as mostly being like a math problem and numerically That's based right. stock charts. Most of what we're talking about here is actually being able to self-manage emotionally despite massive sort of undulations and vacillations of greed and fear and boredom, et cetera. And so a lot of the time, these people that have their head in the sand, like an ostrich are like an ostrich in a three piece suit that is doing something like a professor or an accountant or whatever, where they are so hyper competent in their area. But the idea of stepping into something that they don't understand, being vulnerable and talking about what they don't get, looking in the mirror and being like, I'm not comprehensively competent about money is just so embarrassing that rather than like like I said, achieve that humility, audacity balance where you can like own that vulnerability, but like I'm going to solve it with your help. So I'm never in this position again. They're just ducking it. That is, I mean, I've seen it both ways, but I would say 80% of the time, the person in front of you is a woman and the, and the guy that the person that's hiding is a man and, um, and a hyper logical one at that. And so, um, yeah, for me, there was a time in the workshop where I was, I was calling it, I think I was calling them the matriarchs, but it was like a cohort of women that were essentially slinging their partner over their shoulder and like doing this. And like, and then basically they weren't, a lot of them weren't trading time for money. So they weren't driving revenue, but they were ultimately, and they said this, and then they owned this identity. They were steering the ship of where things were going long-term. Because, you know, like if you take a step back and think about compound interest, which is the governing dynamics of what we're doing here, it is like your amount of money long term is how much you invest times how long you invest times how well you invest. And inside of that income is only half of one of those things. The lion's share of this is your investing. And so by passing that responsibility to your partner, because you're essentially too scared to come to the table and too proud to admit that you're scared they are even though they're not making a dollar with their time they are actually controlling the lion's share of the trajectory that you're on and so helping people with that and then beyond that helping them sort of learn enough and then do enough they i have seen it and i've also seen it not this way that through action they can onboard their kids and then eventually inspire the other person to kind of like creep to the table and start participating, which is really encouraging when you see it. Um, but you don't always see that. No, no, no. Okay. No, I get that. Um, proud and scared. Proud right. and scared. Yeah. Okay. Wow. All right. Have you got another one? I know you do. You got a whole page there. I do. <laughs> um, so to me, probably the most common one would be um, what I would call, I'll go with the more um, PG-13 title, the um, the pooped upon protector. And so essentially that is someone who has been 
really, really loyal to an institution for a really long time. And <laughs> they are getting increasingly not even angry, but just sort of like inwardly sad and like, and like fighting that off yeah. where it's like, why is it that after I've given you this much, like my financial prime, so much of my life, and I'm really relying on you more and more to do right by me in retirement, you're treating me as more and more anonymous, expendable, et cetera. And people like that, who oftentimes they're in their 50s or their 60s, and they are like, I fear that I have aged out of my ability to make a lateral pivot and I'm being treated unfairly in my current situation. I've stagnated. It's a little bit like the exhausted daredevil at that point where they're like, this is unsustainable. My income is not going to go up. I need to figure out how to move from like a 2.2% return to a 22.2% return, or I am likely either to never retire and be in this thankless role forever, or I will get unceremoniously fired, fail to move and then run out of money. This pooped on protector, is this in the context of, of the workplace or at home? Oh, so yeah, this would be... I mean, this could would be at home as well. I guess it, I, that, I could see that, but I mean it more along the lines of somebody who has been working a support role for a um, Goliath of an institution who then just gets treated more and more and more unfairly. And those institutions can vary from, say, like a contract role with like a government operation to like a huge financial firm. It, it um, to me, it's all the same. I recently have worked with somebody who. They're working on paper, what would seem like a really flash job. But when you ask questions under the surface, they talk about their employers the way that somebody might talk about like a mob boss where like these guys can do anything to anybody at any time for any reason. And if I don't figure out some sort of entrepreneurial chops and fi figure out an escape route for myself through investing, like this, this gig will could end at a moment's notice for any reason. And I will be unable to sustain my current lifestyle. Yeah. And so kind of people in that, in yeah, that spot. I know what you mean. That often, maybe this is a, another word for it, but I see often the people that are in the, um, the entertainment industry, mm. so I'm not going to say adult entertainment industry, cause that's not, that's not true, <laughs> but I see people that are <clears throat> usually in the entertainment space. They're in media for a period of time. They know that their income is phenomenal, but that also comes with it, that tremendous amount of insecurity, knowing that it, it, got there through a series of events that maybe they think it's luck. So they, mm. they kind of feel like oh, I can't really take credit for that. When in reality, that's probably, they are probably worth it. Yeah. But they do have this sense whether it's right or wrong, that it's finite and it could be taken away at any stage. So they need to be doing the best they can. It's kind of the same thing that is, it's the escape pathway, isn't it? Absolutely. And I guess the thing that I want to say though, cause that is like this kind, these kinds of people are typically like, fish and water in a bureaucracy, in a hierarchy, in a nine to five structure, which is why they've been there for so long. Right. They are really up against it in terms of needing to dial in a skill set that is completely outside of their comfort zone is people that don't necessarily love pushing their comfort zone. They love routine and inevitability. Yeah. The thing that I would say that is optimism inducing from what I've seen out of the pooped upon protectors is they do need to experience, I would say, a disproportionate amount of disgruntlement before they're willing to question assumptions, make a change, everything like that. And they'll be holding their breath the whole time, like terrified the whole time. But, and I'm thinking in particular of, um, of uh, Kiwi, um, maybe about three years ago, uh, who was 62, had never invested in anything as a result of our first collaboration, that one podcast, he bought one share of Apple, and that was his first investment activity in more than 60 years. Um, if they can take the the extreme fear and, and resentment of the situation and sublimate it into a positive direction, no one is better in execution and follow through and being the person that dots the I's, crosses the T's. And so I've seen people go from having no investment experience or confidence to being able to churn out fat fish one pagers, breaking down companies really well in less than a month because they were not because they were a genius, not because this is like dormant genius that got woken up, but because they took the fear mm. and channeled it in the most useful direction to help them solve the problem that is plaguing them the worst. And that is, that is what we're looking for. And that is, I just want to make it really clear. If you're in that spot, like I, I feel your pain, I don't understand it, but I feel it, but it is solvable, but you have to be willing to break paradigms to do it and not to be like unkind, but most of them never will regardless of the magnitude of the problem, nothing happens unless you're willing to come to the party. You can't go to somebody else and expect that they can solve it if you just pay them enough money. 
No one's going to do this for you. Well, I mean, exactly. And, and part of the sort of symptom of being in that is that you're, I mean, famous paradigm. I heard a good episode that you did recently with somebody who applied this to real estate, but the cash flow quadrant, like ESBI, you can't solve this problem by staying on the left side of that quadrant. You yeah. need to be willing to pivot over and they're not going to run a big business. They don't want to, but you need yeah. to sp- be willing to think like the people that are employing you and not like the role that you've been in. You can't sort of just like turn up, get the free donut and coffee and show up and get the participation points. You have to be willing to question assumptions and attack the kind of thinking that to be frank, like they may have been coasting on for the last decades. Yeah. Future, future mind for the future world you want. Mm. It comes first though. Yeah. Okay. So who else we got? So the next one would be the paralyzed pontificator. It's kind of the exact opposite of the pooped upon protector. That was a lot of peas where, um, yeah, essen- let's, w- let's wipe up the, the table here just for a second. Yeah. <laughs> where essentially they have, there are people that they w- they don't struggle in terms of wanting to pursue risk. And they're also not short in their ability to instinctively feel that certain things are going to happen. But these are the kinds of people that are woulda, coulda, shoulda, shoulda, not investing in Apple in 1995, et cetera. And they can actually make an extremely powerful and believable case for how they did see it. But the problem is that regret and then these now future prognostications where they're talking all about current trends, et cetera, are not being translated in any way into the realm of action. Mm, and so we are a hundred percent in the world of theory and zero percent in the world of action. And so for people in that spot, it is just a question kind of going back to what we were talking about of, cause they'll also probably, they're also likely to sit down with you and without you even needing to ask them anything, go off about their point A, their point B, they've already thought through the bigger picture. It's just like, how do you help them on the ground so that they actually do something? Totally. And in their case, it is just helping them anchor on one target, not 15, and then give them one strategy, not 15, and help slap their hand away from shiny object syndrome and stuff and help them just left foot, right foot, take action. And people in this area that are able to get out of their own way in terms of having like an intellect, an ego about their own intellect that are actually willing to let somebody in and, and sort of go through somebody else's innovation to help them unlock their own innovativeness, they will be massively appreciative and like a joy to be around. And, but to me, it's just making sure that they are, as Einstein said, like keeping things as simple as possible, but not simpler. And they found that consistent and preferably in some way automated drumbeat of guaranteed action into the future. And so get them out of the way of sort of thinking that making something sound sophisticated is the end, the end all be all. And actually like simple, simple and actionable and consistent for them is the end all be all. And people in that spot are capable of tremendous things because usually risk aversion is not an issue. Certainly creativity and lateral thinking and entrepreneurial thinking, not an issue. It's just translating it into the realm of fruition. Um. Sometimes it's really hard to get them across though. Do you find like out of all the people that we've spoken about so far, so far, do you find that they're potentially sometimes the hardest ones to shift? I'm glad that you asked that actually. It's extremely, that's a great insight. So to me, it's like who of everyone that I've mentioned so far is likely to, to invent a masterful rationalization. You know, because that's the whole thing. And if you can get someone to own that they sounded so smart to themselves inside their own head every time they decided not to do something, like, okay, so how do we end this bottomless cycle of you sounding really smart while making mistakes? Like, how do do we bring this to a um, sudden, purposeful, forceful closure for your own benefit? And just see what they say. And uh, <laughs> and if they can talk their way out of that, they deserve to lose. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. They deserve to lose. Yeah, no, it is like it is possible to shift them, right? But it's it's like you you, you can't play on that. You can't, it's not just a competition about how smart you are. But it sounds like you have a very particular story in your head to even th- to think to ask that question. I've seen it all. I've yeah. seen it all, man. But but it, that's part of what I enjoy doing. Mm. Like in terms of giving advice, again, it's like ninety percent mindset. And once people are comfortable with talking about what actually stops them from getting wealthy, mm. that's when it's amazing because you've just busted down some blockages and barriers and 
Like, I don't care if I'm right. All I want to do is build wealth in somebody else mm. and hopefully see them do it in somebody else as well. Mm. So I've got nothing to win by being right. And I think sometimes when those that are prone to analysis paralysis, when they realize it's not about being smart and technically correct, that's freeing for them too. You're almost giving them permission to not be perfect. That is so incredibly accurate. And I think it's also fair to say that of everyone that has been mentioned so far, who's most likely to have, let's say, like PhD or MFA or CFA after their names, it's oh. this. And to me, and this is a thing where I'm here to help anybody that has the aforementioned problems and wants to achieve the aforementioned outcomes. I'm not going to like discriminate based on job title or anything like that. Yeah. However, it is massively satisfying when you help somebody that people would call like a tradie or whatever outperform these people that are like puffed up and like throwing seven syllable words as an intimidation tactic, et cetera, et cetera. But it, who can often be paralyzed pontificators. But at the same time, if those people want help and they're serious about getting it and there's a real reason for them to transcend this trap where they're getting by, but they're not thriving and they know it and they're beating themselves up in their own mind, which is why they're, it's becoming a tighter loop of sort of procrastination and self-defeat. If they're serious about that, I do believe in their ability to be the easiest person to help where at one time they were like impossible to help. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Who's the next, who's the next one? So the next one would be, uh, and we have a friend just up the street who uh, who meets this description at a very high level. All right, yeah. Um, I'm calling it the will be windfaller or the inhibited inheritor, whichever you prefer. Until you come up with a better one, like lettuce hands. But essentially, it's somebody who the pressure that's coming on them is not painful or in, in like a crushing and limiting way, like with the pooped upon protector, or the exhausted daredevil, it's actually a positive thing, but it's being perceived in a negative way. And so it's somebody who has, let's say like an inheritance coming or they're after long, at long last, they've been bootstrapping since forever. They're going to sell their business for seven or eight figures. And they're like, oh my God, I've never thought about investing. I've just been running a business this whole time. But people who are, uh, have real estate that they don't want to hold anymore and they want to let it go and see if they can be entrepreneurial in, in thinking of different solutions, whatever the situation may be, there's a windfall that's coming and they're not ready for that lump sum and they know it. And so they're thinking about, they're probably doing like deep fear-based research on like lottery winners that blew it, et cetera. And being like, how do I not be in that position? And how do I not turn this absolute privilege of a situation into like the worst experience of my life? And so for them, ultimately what they need more than anything else is to set the intention of having it be that like they know when D-Day is going to happen. Mm. They know that on whatever day this money is hitting their hands and the intention and transformation is that when they did, when that day comes, they are so excited about it hitting their hands because they already know what to do with it yeah, and right. they know how they're going to build on it forever rather than it hits their hands and now they're completely panicking and, and, and they're spiraling in a very wasteful direction in terms of squandered money and missed opportunities. And so for me, I mean, they're in a... Um, there's a very bleak, bleak piece of advice in um, aspect like arenas and pockets of marketing and sales, which is like you're best off finding people that would have hit a triple without you and then hit, helping them hit a grand slam. I disagree. I like helping people from every walk of life, but people like this that are in this strong of a spot where they're solving by dint of the fact that this windfall is coming, they have urgency to solve it. If they can just summon some courage to ask good questions, make some adjustments and follow through, I mean, nobody's in a more promising position, but will they? Mm. And that is certainly not guaranteed. And when you put a question mark around the solvency bit, not necessarily around, well, yeah, the, the question mark could be two bits. So what we're talking about is um, when they come into possession of that money. So like if there's any uncertainty around the timing of when that event is going to happen to mm. unlock that or the magnitude of what that is, then it's kind of, it takes on another twist doesn't it because i'm specifically thinking about inheritance yeah where more often than not i think yeah i'd say well definitely with the people that i sit in front of so it's a subset of people obviously it feels like people will unreasonably discount the inevitability of an inheritance coming in in other words hmm. i'm not going to rely on that no way because that that's a gift if it happens it happens it's great you know it's not mine to say i don't want even want to think about that and that's noble there's a little bit of false pride sometimes with that as well. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that 
people might do themselves a disservice by completely discounting something that is probably at the very least statistically possible, especially if there is four parties. Like, let's say um, there's a husband and a wife, and they both have two parents that are alive, but they're separated, and they each have four buckets of potential inheritances, let's say. We don't know when the time frame is. We don't know how much they're going to spend on the way out, and we don't know what kind of arguments they're going to be. So there's a lot of issues around this, mm. by the way. But when it's an absolute certainty that this couple is going to get at least one of those payouts coming through via an inheritance within their time frame, usually it's happening at the commencement of their retirement, usually just because of age ranges and stuff like that with parents. Hmm. Usually it's around the same time that the kids are in need of some assistance to get started in the housing market. And almost without fail, that couple is putting themselves under immense stress and sacrifice to get to a landing place at time of retirement on their own steam mm -hmm. without actually acknowledging the fact that they're going to get some help at some stage. And I think it's like, it's, it's like another layer of that issue that they haven't prepared the container for when that thing is coming. Mm. They don't know what they're going to do with it. it freaks them out. But also it's got all this other second and third order consequences. Like they haven't actually got any certainty around any other aspect of the life and they're going to risk what they currently have because they're under the burden of that false assumption they've set. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it sounds complicated the way I'm saying it. But. Well, I, I think I understand where essentially they, um, they refuse to psychologically and then strategically bring it into the fold yeah. of something that they own. Mm. And so simul it's like, consequently they're actually playing with a very limited toolkit compared to what they truly exactly. have right. and that causes so many unnecessary complications and that that well, i think the term that you used was do you say false pride but but some sort of like yeah. misused misplaced ego where it's like well if i'm and that's another thing where like and this is would be a whole different um episode but basically all of the self-defeating deeply embedded beliefs that people have not just in new zealand but worldwide about money one of them is it cuts exa exactly against intelligent laziness is like i if i don't grind then i'm not successful like sure. i have to bleed for this to be a win yeah. and disabusing yourself of that notion can make your life so much easier because life is hard enough even if you do have the benefit and you embrace the benefit of having certain edges like that and so just disabusing yourself of the idea that this needs to be hard and uh, and i think the way to do that like i said is kind of zooming out and thinking about what are the things that you have been sort of carrying on your back and you just don't want to be de dealing with that anymore and they're getting it's getting worse not better and then where are the things that you want to do not just for yourself but for your spouse for your children for your bigger picture family for your community whatever the case may be that now this gift will enable you to actualize if you actually embrace the fact that you're getting an unfair edge and then turning it turning it into something and if you if you aren't willing to do that kind of thinking then yeah i suppose it would just you could find yourself in a completely unnecessary sea of shame when really you should be incredibly grateful for the opportunities in front of you and probably another episode right like the but I think it's important right now. I think it's important right now because we're living in a society which is increasingly leaning towards a bit more socialism. And where I'm going with that is that I think some of that comes from a sense that you you do need to bleed to lead. Mm. Like there there needs to be there needs to be some pain. There needs to be some suffering. And if there isn't, it means there's a reward for someone who isn't worthy enough to receive it. In other words, there's justification to attack the rich as a replacement poor replacement to helping the poor mm. and yes i think that like there's probably a lot in that actually isn't there oh i mean absolutely i mean i feel like there's a there's a power maxim there that is eluding me but essentially to to state the obvious destructive action and constructive action are not the are not of the same usefulness not just for yourself but for the world around you and so like in a lot of ways it's a strange way to find a way to be victimy despite the fact that you're in a privileged situation yeah how did you do that and you know, that's not easy to do and yeah. so it's like what can you bleed to lead and constructively build with this 
unfair advantage that you have. And so, and so can you move from this destructive sort of myopic me, me, me think to like, okay, I've got a million dollars that I didn't earn coming in. How can I turn that into 12 million so that I can benefit these causes that as it currently stands are not being advocated for enough. But of course that then forces you to step, like we were saying from sort of a consumer employee victim mentality to an entrepreneur, leader, investor, philanthropist, altruist mentality. And that is, um, I've been having a lot of conversations about this actually lately is like what we are ultimately talking about reductive though it might sound is finding ways to elevate intracranially just for you inside of your own brain from your lower self to your higher self. And if you're not careful, you can just devolve into playing and thinking very small where a lot of this is an exercise in how can you think and play and serve at a higher level. Mm. And generally speaking, this is what we were talking about in terms of what I feel you do so well with this podcast is the right place to be is you're constantly learning and evolving for the sake of serving, not just yourself, but the world around you and leaving this place in some way or another better than you found it. And so if you're in this sort of, um, inhibited inheritor will be windfall or I am a victim because I'm receiving a million dollars like mentality. How can you get from lower to upper and how can you stay there? Yeah. And why, why would you want to get from lower to upper? Because Mm. some people feel like they're not worthy to go any higher. You know, something, it's funny. It's something that comes back when I ask about what people intend to do, not just for themselves and for their families, but for the broader community. It's interesting. A lot of the time what comes back is pet sanctuaries, like animal sanctuaries. They feel that animals are being disproportionately, I think also in New Zealand, that animals are being treated awfully and they want to create a scenario Mm -hmm. where people like sort of animals are being treated with the humaneness of humans and just any kind of vision like that. I mean, it's just such a better use of your time than being like they're unfairly wealthy and um, I don't know what to do with my inheritance. Yeah. Like it's, it is actually sometimes embarrassing, I think too, because people feel like ashamed to be privileged because, and you can tell because we're going away in a month and we're going to go overseas and we're so pro like you'll, you'll hear the fact that they feel like they have to say that they're privileged. Maybe I'm thinking too much into it and they're just stating the fact, but the fact that they have to say that or they feel like they have to say that means that there's something that's causing them to say that. I know that sounds oversimplistic, but there's something in it. Hmm. Okay. Give me another one. <laughs> I absolutely agree with everything that you just said. Yeah. And just, yet, just say that and you'll make me happy, Cole. Every, find, every well, time. <laughs> just finding finding ways to not be ashamed or paralyzed by blessings in your life mm. as a, on a common sense level, probably a good idea. Yeah. Um, yeah. So pivoting over, we have, um, the disgruntled backseat driver. And so that would be somebody who you can find with pulsing neck veins screaming like, Oh, I got to fire the, I got to fire my newsletter. I got to fire my financial advisor. And it's a little bit like the paralyzed pontificator, except they're angry um, and not doing anything where it's like, why haven't I, why can't I, why am I stuck in this unhappy dependence? Why can't I figure this out? And I, it feels like most people that I talk to particularly stateside are so fed up with um, having somebody take 2% of their net worth and then a certain amount of their capital gains year in, year out for delivering tepid results at best. I was I was worked with a 63-year-old lawyer uh, where he came on a sort of a grad group call and he was saying that um, he taught his financial advisor a bunch and then fired him. And I was like, wow. <laughs> I was like, can I can I get that on audio? But um <laughs> but basically like if they feel like and obviously there are amazing financial advisors in the world to try and demonize every single financial advisor is ridiculous. But I do think that they're probably in the deep minority because they're not they're not um prioritizing their clients' well-being as much as their own ability to do jet around the world, uh, et cetera. And um and so essentially they can feel that the disgruntled backseat driver and they they don't like having someone tell them what to invest in, but they just can't figure it out. And so I think for them, the, the big thing is checking your intentions and be like, okay, so the purpose of your complaining here and the reason that the, in, the complaining is intensifying and the action is not intensifying at all, is it that you don't believe 
that this is doable and you just kind of need to vent because in a lot of ways i mean again i've i've seen this coming from new york a function of financial advisors that they can be sort of like a burning effigy where they will like take the abuse and the emotion the emotional vacillations of their clients who just need an outlet for their frustration but then they're like okay just you know i'll keep sending you the weekly reports and just don't fall off a cliff here is it that or are you actually willing to believe that you can make a pivot and able to pursue an adjustment and um or are you just talking and it's totally fine to just be talking as long as you're aware that you're venting and you don't have some delusion that you're actually going to do something but for me ultimately yeah the disgruntled backseat driver just needs to have a bit of a come to jesus with themselves about this is like it is okay to be dependent on someone else if that's your choice but if this is the situation, you can't continue to do this ad nauseum forever. So like we're in kind of in in pivot or I don't know, take a Xanax and chill out situation. I like that because I think a lot of people that do use, uh, say, private wealth managers or um, financial advisors that operate on a funds under management percentage model in terms of their fees, there's probably a few clients that would of theirs that would fit into this category to some degree. And it wouldn't be that hard for their clients, I guess, to lose confidence in what their advisor is doing because it's so easy to substitute the, the function of what financial advisors do that do do that. So easy just to assume that their role is to pick the right stocks for me and maximize the performance at any frame in this movie. Mm. So at every single time I need to be performing better than the index. Otherwise, I'm going to get disgruntled and complain to the advisor who should have known better. Right. And so I think that there's, there's a lot of people that probably fall into this position just because of the way that it's structured. But I, that, that's also kind of where I see the evolution. This is what makes me excited, because I know that what I do as a financial advice model is quite different. It's probably closer to you than it is to who I just described. But and I think that that's kind of where evolution probably needs to go, mm. to be honest. And, and I don't know how you feel about this, but with the way that technology is going, where people have the access to the tools now that they didn't have before, and it's so easy to access information from people like us having a conversation, perhaps it's easy to implement now. It's easy to get access. Therefore, what is the role of a traditional financial advisor? Yes. It has to change, right? To be relevant. That, yeah. So I'm thinking of when you, when you're talking about that, I have... Uh, two things. One is an observation that definitely has tie in back to sort of the current AI discourse. And then another one is like a personal ax to grind that I would like to briefly say. Let's please grind but, um, away, man. <laughs> but essentially there was a, I'm recalling in like 23, 20, 2013, 2014 in New York, there was sort of like page one clamor that robo advisors were going to do in the traditional finance industry. I was hearing this constantly being in the Wall Street environment. And um, obviously that didn't come to pass. And so the question is, why not? And then is there anything that's going on now that's materially different than then? I do think, and this definitely partially, at least partially answers the question, is that like a major function that financial advisors should be meeting, but I would argue that a lot of the time they don't, or they're doing it in an extraordinarily lackluster way, is providing emotional support that then keeps the clients supremely unlikely to self-sabotage during major moments of greed and fear, optimism or pessimism, et cetera. And so this brings me to my ax to grind. I am like my closest soul brother in the space, other than you, of course, is um, the great Peter Lynch, who wrote three books. Uh, he was the most successful institutional investor of the 1980s. He turned roughly I want to say 18 million into 14 billion in 13 years, and then wrote three books saying that he would have had more success in less time if he had been an amateur investor for a couple of reasons, including the ability to concentrate rather than diversify. I have read the majority of sort of the mainstream literature in the space, and I can tell that somebody has really done their homework and they're really, really trying to sort of, I think we could say, um, confirmation bias their way to victory is the only thing that and i, I shouldn't name names but i want to the <laughs> the only time i'll that, bleep it out later on if i need to don't worry <laughs> the only time that they mentioned peter lynch is when they mentioned that you know stock picking is a bad idea it's gambling because peter lynch was the best investor 29 percent annualized return for 13 years and yet his average client lost money and so the observation 
is that's so carefully researched that it's kind of amazing, but it's missing the point. What happened was Peter Lynch was effectively the Michael Jordan of institutional investing. And even so, the best guy with the best track record, his average client sold, panic sold at a loss at that moment. And that is because Peter Lynch was unable to just, and not as a result of him personally, but as a result of the model, the form factor, he was unable to provide that sort of like bespoke, personal, emotional first support that would keep people from overreacting to ups and downs. Mm -hmm. And so consequently, a major danger in being a disgruntled backseat driver is that you're really likely to careen off of a cliff, to go from complaining, 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 to careening off of a cliff. The moment that, to your point, you have any piece of informed pessimism about the competency or just short or immediate term success of the advisor, you can self-sabotage at any time. Yeah. And so that's a key principle underpinning what I'm doing is if people have actually trained themselves to do this, they're supremely unlikely to self-sabotage where even if Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger, Peter Lynch is investing your money for you, you are not inoculated from that unless you were to like burn all of your phones and make it impossible to contact them, period. Wow. So I'm, I'm thinking specifically of high net worth advisors that work with people with $5 million plus, they'll often be there for mindset. It's because if you can't help people set their mind, they'll get upset and then it all falls apart. Mm. So you, you kind of have to keep them on board with the mission, remind them what the objectives are, even something as simple as insurance, like bringing it right back down to one of the things that we do here in my work is setting up insurance plans. People will just occasionally, no matter how much time you explain as to why you need this, why it's important, they will get upset when the inevitable happens, the mm. premiums go up. And then it's broken. It's wrong. No one told me about this, even though they did throw it away. Then they get cancer and die. Mm. Like, I know that's extreme, but that's kind of like what would happen in the equivalent in the investor world. As soon as you check out of that, then that's your biggest mistake, right? Like you actually have to fully understand it for yourself, which is ironic, right? Because if you really fully understand it for yourself, you're probably not going to be using an advisor. Well, exactly. And so, and that's kind of, that's kind of the entire thing is that's that yeah. if you're trying to just like pass the buck, don't, and this is kind of what I mean by backseat driver is if you're going to be in the backseat, and this is the same thing with the mismatched matrimony. If you've made the decision, the emotional decision that you are uninvolved, then be uninvolved because you can't be conditional. Mm -hmm. You can't yeah, be no, conditionally yeah. temper, like tempestuously and selectively involved. Yeah. That's how, that's how bad things happen. And that is the case, whether it is your spouse, your child, your parent investing your money or the Michael Jordan of investing. Yeah. And that is exactly why training yourself to learn how to do this, like having your own personal set of if then systems yes. is supremely likely to keep you from having something like that happen to yourself. Yeah. Get a strategy. Simple. Yeah. Okay. Let's do one more. Let's say the, let's say the entombed millionaire. Nice. And I put, I have um, a millionaire in quotes. And so it's somebody who is a millionaire, but they don't feel like a millionaire. Okay. Yeah. And they are in probably in their dream home. They have a mortgage on it. Mortgage, as we've discussed, is a French word that means death pledge. And it's feeling like a death pledge. And so essentially they're coming towards the end of their job. And so they're like trading time and talent for money. And so revenue is soon enough going to go to zero. And in consequence, in a post, they're not ready for a post-revenue environment. And so consequently, their dream home has and dream life is increasingly devolving into sort of a live-in coffin that it feels too expensive to leave. Yeah, that's so good. And yeah. so now they won't they won't travel, they won't you maybe even like do takeout or like delivery food. They're like living like Asset paupers rich, inside of this yeah. inside of this fortress. But actually um yeah, it's like it, it's asset rich, but confidence poor. And so what I found with the entombed millionaire and I had in particular, there's one person that I'm thinking of that came in as a result of our collaboration last year, who was um, on the South Island working in some field of, of like entrepreneurial medicine and um, like self-employed surgeon, basically. And 
was living this way and and uh and essentially had been saying that like they and their wife had been meaning to go on some great treks in new zealand for decades and like even though arguably they'd socked enough um money away to retire they were like i am concerned that i am going to like kind of like die bored and still drilling holes in people's teeth rather than like enjoy the fruits of what I've, I've earned and essentially for them. And I, and I would say that the entombed millionaire is up against it because they are deep into either momentum or inertia, depending on how you want to define it. But for the people that can actually get out of their own way, learn something new, learn it with real purpose, similarly to the uh, inhibited inheritor will be windfaller. If they can, if the intention can be, I know when D-Day is, when the revenue is going to stop, and I'm going to be excited for that day rather than dreading it and terrified. It's a reversible condition. And in the case of the, um, the doctor that I mentioned, all that was missing was not, he didn't need more money. He just needed 100% conviction in what he was doing with his financial life's work. And in possession of that, he and his wife immediately went on this trek of New Zealand that they'd been meaning to go on and maybe would go on in like five or 10 years. Yeah. And he just immediate, immediately accelerated his retirement trajectory by like five or 10 years on the spot yeah. just by filling in his blind spots and so for me like most of this is like every problem is a problem of perspective and if you're in a position where your dream home or your dream life have turned into that live-in coffin it's probably just a self-education and a um just a mental adjustment and once you've made that made that independence entrepreneurial adjustment you might well be able to step into retirement on the spot so what can you say about your process? You mentioned eight week course, you mentioned that you can potentially bring some transformation into people's lives. And what does it cost? So I can give you the principle. The principle is that it needs to be little enough in terms of first of all, there's nothing there's no like permanent ongoing thing, right? You're never paying a percentage of your net worth or anything like that. It needs to be modest enough that anybody worldwide who's struggling under the problems of I work because I have to, not because I want to, and I am terrified I'm going to outlive my money, can afford the workshop, can afford to take powerful action during the workshop. On the other hand, and I've learned this the hard way, you know, mates rates, free for friends and family, they don't do anything. It needs to be priced in such a way that you remember the moment that you entered and under no circumstance does this experience take on the feel of like a series of YouTube videos or some like self-help book still wrapped in cellophane that you intended to use. <laughs> that will never happen, not on my watch. And the more that I, the more experience that I get, the more that I understand like my own coaches and mentors philosophy that skin in the game is good. And if you don't have skin in the game and you don't have an exciting target you're aiming at, you're just not going to do much of anything. So I can give you the principle. Yeah, no, that's good. And I think what the reason why it's, it's probably that's appropriate is that there is a correlation between how much you pay for something and the outcome. And I think sometimes if, if it's free, you're less likely to engage in it. Or if it's a low cost, even you're less likely to really respect it. You might get some change some of the time. I've, totally observe this in my own practice, right? Like the higher you make the price, the more success you have. It's crazy. Maybe it's because you're attracting only people that can afford it. And there's a high correlation between that and people that take action. But I don't think that's true either, because I've seen some people really um, defer even meeting with me for a while because they're saving up. And it's bizarre, but those are the ones that make it make it work. Even with the courses that we've made recently, uh, when it's free, people sign up, they don't do it. When it costs money, they do it. Mm. So what do you do? And if they perceive, well, it's just a strange wrinkle again, like we're so much we've talked about is sort of like emotionally based. If it is free, it is perceived as worthless. If it is cheap, it is perceived as et cetera. And to me also the psychology, because part of what I'm also building is a community of people. A question to ask yourself is who would you rather be and who would you rather be surrounded by? Yeah. Bargain hunters, freeloaders or investors. And so for me, I would rather be surrounded by people with skin in the game and similar outcomes. And that's what I'm looking to reverse engineer. It's mindset. Always got to bring it back to that, right? Mm. Like if you surround yourself with the right people and you pay what it takes to do that up front, you're making an investment, just like any investment, you're going to see a return. So it's great. Absolutely. It. Awesome. So where people, where can people find you? Where should we point people? 
I would suggest if if um, you resonate with the archetypes of investor um, that like we're saying are likely to be able to take effective action, I would recommend going to findfatfish.com and then just going through the simple choose your own adventure on that website, filtering filtering yourself in or out according to where you're interested, but more importantly, where you're committed to creating a before and after transformation. And if you're in the situation where you're sort of in those archetypes of people that aren't suited to do this very well, I would just recommend doing some serious private thinking along the lines of what Darcy and I have been talking about this whole time. And when you are feeling like you're ready to hit this like a ton of bricks under your own power, then check out Fine Fat Fish. Fantastic. That's awesome. Thank you very much, Cole. And we'll catch you maybe in what, 12 months time, perhaps. Sounds, but it sounds at this cadence. Yeah. Sounds about right. All right. <laughs> See Good you man. then. All right. Cheers.